Welcome to B2B Impacts by BDB. Join me, Matt Smith, CEO at BDB, and Oliver Brewood, BDB's Head of Digital and Technology, as we get together to discuss the myriad of trends, topics, opportunities, and developments in the world of B2B marketing and communications. Our aim is to arm you with content, opinions, and insights that deliver lasting and meaningful impacts across the B2B community, helping the global businesses and brands we partner with navigate their way through the information and communication revolution. Are you ready to make an impact? Hi everybody and welcome to the B2B Impact Podcast and on uh, this week's episode we're going to be focusing on uh, I guess a relatively new buzzword that I'm sure everybody's becoming more increasingly familiar with and potentially nervous about as well, the metaverse. Um, so I think it will have come to the forefront for a lot of people including ourselves so there's a huge caveat here that we are learning as we go. Uh, we're certainly immersing ourselves in all things uh, meta to ensure our businesses and brands that we work with um, and our own business and brand can be uh, meta ready for whatever it is and when it comes. But I guess it came to the forefront most recently, Ollie, on uh, as a result of uh, Mr. Zuckerberg at Facebook doing his kind of uh, crazy keynote. Yeah. Um, I, I'm assuming it was probably a similar kind of situation for you when you first came across it. Yeah, I mean, obviously within the realm of fiction, I think it's something we're, we're all familiar with uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the concepts. If anybody's seen or read uh, Ready Player One, mm -hmm. it's, um, that's, that's very much relevant to what that is. But I think when it hit the, the mainstream, I'd say, is, is the, you know, the Facebook rebrand and, and Mark mm -hmm. Zuckerberg's uh, yeah, speech. It was, that, it was a term that was used originally, wasn't it? I think in like sci-fi novels back in was it the yeah. 80s or 90s I or something. I feel it's bad. I can't remember the name of the, oh, the I think novel. I probably got it up here somewhere. But um, I know it was... Snow crash or something by Neil yeah, yeah, Stevenson. Snow crash. So, so it's not actually a term that Zuckerberg has come up with, and it's also not the new version of the internet. Because I think people that I've been speaking to, sort of anecdotally, whether it's um, over drinks or um, through through uh, BDB, obviously, or through our work with Virtual Visitor, I think a lot of confusion is that this is effectively like the next version of. Uh, web and web 3.0 yeah um which i think is where i started off as well because the way he presents it in the keynote is almost as if yeah this is something that facebook are creating or meta i guess as they're rebranding to now to show their uh, investment in it um but something that they're almost creating as their own asset which certainly isn't the case is it so yeah and I, I guess with a lot of this stuff it just will have to come down uh, to time and, and seeing where things pan out but you're right in that web 3.0 and the technology to support it uh are key to the metaverse mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be two distinct phases of of evolution of the internet yeah so if, effectively for anybody who might not be familiar with the phrase metaverse um certainly um i'm sure jim in post can share some links and and some footage of these kind of things to bring it to life in some of the videos that we're referring to here in terms of um zuckerberg's keynote and so on they're all freely available on uh, on youtube um but effectively the metaverse is what i would term a deeper, more immersive online experience, ultimately, uh, combining virtual reality, potentially augmented reality, better use of AI, so they're, they're thinking things like voice, um, voice interactions and your, basically your ability to search and find information quicker due to it being decentralized through Web 3.0, and come on to that term as well if that's something that we want to elaborate on further will lead to a much deeper online experience. So as Ollie said, Ready Player One, which is kind of a, a really good reference point, I think, for people to understand what it is. I think the geeks tend to think that's a really poor reference point for it <laughs> because they think it's like a, a Hollywood representation of it. But for me personally, I think that's one of the- one In terms of, of understanding the yeah. concept, I think it gets you in there, which is if, if nobody's seen the film or read the book, there is a 3D uh, virtual reality world. People pop on their VR headsets, gloves and, and suits and things like that, and mm -hmm. they jump into this virtual world and after that, it's it's akin to almost living a second life. And within that uh, universe, then people go to school in it, they go to work in it, they game in it. it. It's an entire experience where people can, you know, spend 20 odd hours a day in there sort of thing. But the, the fact that it's right in front of your eyes and it's all consuming and that it's to scale, yeah. I think is what really starts tricking your brain. And then you start thinking, I guess, about you know, how would that apply in, in a business sense? Yep. And you, you can obviously, whether it's B2C or B2B, you can start thinking about, you know, what experiences would be better if you were physically there. Yep. You know, if I was looking at a huge piece of equipment, instead of just seeing it 
on a on a 15 inch screen that's uh, a foot or two away from me um you know where it doesn't feel real i could be seeing that physically in front of me life size mm -hmm. um have the ability to walk around it and see what what that piece of equipment is if i'm if i'm wanting to think about a consumer example you might be physically walking around a shop which takes longer and is more time consuming obviously than just browsing a website but if you want to give a sense of what a product physically looks like mm -hmm. and how you know being able to turn it around and look at the back of it and see it physically compared to other products you know even tv buying you get a sense of like oh that's what a 32 inch tv looks yeah. like versus that's what a 65 saw some stuff online the other day i think it was h&m and dolce mm -hmm. and gabbana have already started sort of opening stores within the metaverse which yeah. you can come on to in terms of experiences it's, it's, it's quite rudimentary stuff at the minute i guess but i always think with stuff like this you'll get the naysayers uh, who will look for the limitations of it. So particularly in B2B, I always think there's a big uh, challenge around people questioning, well, nothing's better than being there in person. So I always tend to flip it the other way and think about the opportunities to sort of increase global reach, but also with like large pieces of kit or machinery or technology, the ability, you can still walk around it and see it at scale, like you're saying, never also pull it apart, play with it, break yeah. it down, step into the machine, which obviously you couldn't do in the real world as well. Yeah. But in, t in terms of the speed of adoption of things like this, one of the things I've had on my list of things here to sort of touch around was, you're already seeing big B2C brands entering the metaverse, so to speak, which is a, a very broad phrase at the minute, given there's only kind of, I think, four different metaverse platforms that are kind of established for the meantime. But Nike, Adidas, um, are already buying large sizable plots plots of land in the metaverse which is something else we can come on to but and b2b b, b to b always typically follows so in the sense of slower slower pace of adoption do you think that's going to be the case here and do you think that's going to be led by maybe the age profile or demographics within b2b yeah that would be my uh suspicion here is if you look at the brands that are entering it now they're consumer brands if you think about the target audience that's currently embracing things like the metaverse and, and future technology it is more likely to be a certain demographic or you know a certain age group probably a younger age group so uh, my assumption here is that these brands are looking at it and going the people that are currently using this are our target audience all the people that we think are going to be using this sooner are our target audience mm -hmm which probably isn't the same for B2B buyers at the minute. Yeah. It's, it's probably not where you know you need to run out and start land grabbing straight away. Mm -hmm. But it is something to bear in mind is that all those people at some point um, will be your target audience. Yeah. So um, if the metaverse is the future, mm -hmm. um, and obviously with companies like Facebook invest, or Meta, investing as much as they are, you've got to believe that it's gonna be there in some capacity. We've got to understand that at some point it's likely that that your b2b buyers are going to be there your audience is going to be there and you're probably going to want to have some presence there too what's your what's your take on that because i actually thought you'd be all over this being sci-fi um try not to say geek um but in the sense of i thought you'd be like really into this and thinking this was the future and that it's going to you know take over and so on but i think you're more measured than that aren't you in your kind of take on it so far well i'm, I'm aware of the fact that going back to my example about like browsing uh uh tv store like yes you can get a sense of size and scale and things like that but i could also do that on a website and i suspect much faster i so i guess it really depends how things shape up yeah. but physically walking around a shop or physically traveling to a shop has the possibility to take time that typing 10 words into a browser doesn't take me yeah so i guess there's, there's that aspect to it so i think it's for me, if the metaverse is going to be the next big thing, it's got to be delivering on a, an experience that makes any potential extra time to, to access it worthwhile. Because even if you think about the technology involved, and this is always going to get better, yeah. but loading a game takes time. And what sure. you're effectively doing when you access the metaverse is is loading a game. So yeah. even if that's a one or two minute delay, yeah. that's significant compared to opening your laptop or phone and just typing a few words in that's, where they're typically always on and ready to use. That's where I think, yeah, there's certainly got to be advancements and improvements. I guess like coming at it from the other angle, seeing things in kind of beta mode at the minute and early, early, um, early attempts at it. If they, these are the early attempts, I dread to think what it would be like in five years time. And I think with the decentralized data side of things that's where voice is going to come into its own and in speed of actually locating things and the way you'll do it I assu i'm assuming you'll be in an environment with a headset on asking a question like you yeah. would to google and you'll be getting the answer in some kind of visionary so you might be literally field, going loading, 
Um, and I'm I'm pretty sure that's that's the route it will go down with it. I, I do also think that there needs to be massive advancements with the technology side of things. Because before we uh, started recording, I was saying to you about the, the headsets and so on. They get heavy. They're uncomfortable. They're warm. Yeah. And for me, until the the, uh, the VR headsets or goggles become more like a pair of glasses in a way, I don't think you're going to yeah. see mainstream adoption. I can't see B two B C suites at the minute yeah. sat there. I mean. Maybe you would have argued you couldn't see them using Zoom and you couldn't see them on Teams pre-pandemic. Yeah. But I could, can't I can't see your your 50, 60 year old C suiter with a VR headset on talking to their colleagues around the world sat in a virtual meeting room. Yeah, I think there's but, I think there's a big difference between uh, where we think this technology is gonna go, which will hopefully be akin to putting on a pair of glasses mm -hmm. versus where it is now, yeah. where you're putting on a headset that involves straps. Yeah not always that comfortable out of the box. So I've just re uh, bought a uh, bit of padding that goes on mine, which just helps to, to increase the support and mm -hmm. grip and stuff like that. Um, you've got concerns then, is it messing up your hair? Does it look stupid? Okay. What's going on around you? You don't have any sense of what's going on around you while you're wearing one of these headsets, which yeah. might be more concerning to some than others. If, if we can get to the point where it's just a pair of glasses, you're popping on and off, yeah. possibly with a quick look through button so you can see what the, you know your environment around you. Yeah. I think that's when it becomes much more accessible and, and less off-putting. Yeah. And then um, just anecdotal again, playing the other day on the the meta or Facebook kind of work rooms, I think it's called something like that at the minute, which again is just in, in beta mode. So it's nowhere near kind of final. Um, but I'm really keen for us to, to shoot a podcast from within it, um, from within the metaverse, so to speak in the coming weeks, um, given we've both got the pieces of kit to actually do it because um, having played with it early this week, one of the things I think we've struggled with mid and during the pandemic, obviously working in a creative space is kind of brainstorms when you're trying to engage with people and get people feeling like you're in the room with them because there's nothing there is nothing better than me in a brainstorm of being yeah. there in the room and I think that's people. going back to that point you said before is that you know you start thinking about that b2b audience and their pushback might be like yeah it's, it's much better to be in a, in a room with someone than it is to be on teams or, or you know virtually but that's not always practical is it we've seen that with the pandemic and, and going beyond the pandemic there's lots of reasons why it might not be possible either because somebody's working from home that day as a simple example or because you're physically located in different places i think the, the, the working life's changed people's conscious efforts in sustainability has changed people have realized you don't need to travel the world and spend a fortune on travel and expensive to do business um, and i do think it's accelerated digital transformation ridiculously in the pandemic i think stepping into a virtual meeting room and putting your headset on and looking at somebody's avatar rather than looking at you across the desk here is a different level again. Yeah. You're asking people to kind of take a great stride again forward. What I would say is having played with it, it was pretty cool in yeah. the sense of you sat there, you can move around the desk, you could see people around the desk, it picks up all your hand gestures and your articulations. You could load up presentations and PowerPoints and videos. You could call up the web. The, the thing that got me that I thought was crazy was that you could see your own laptop. I don't know if you've seen this. No, I've, so I've played with something similar. But... It maps your laptop onto the desk that you put, you draw your desk, it maps your laptop onto it so you can type with your headset on, which I thought was crazy. Yeah, yeah. And then, I've, I've had the headset on and I've had, um, I've had like my desktop screen showing yeah, on there, yeah. mirrored, but I've not had the keyboard and you realize that without seeing the keyboard, even though I can touch type, yeah. it's damn near impossible because yeah. you're losing your sense of where the keyboard even is yeah. in your world. So I can see if you can actually physically see a digital version of your keyboard, you're more likely to be able to. And, the, and then you could transfer to the whiteboard, which I found just another crazy feature. And I'd say hopefully we'll be able to demo and showcase this in the coming weeks, but literally you clicked a button and then you were at the whiteboard, but all the other people in the room were watching you on the whiteboard, right? And the, the actual, haptic feedback of when the when you control about the pen was touching the whiteboard was just yeah crazy to get your head around when you talk about brainstorming and taking notes and capturing it and people being able to flip in and out and move around the room it was a damn sight more intuitive than i thought it would be but you've not done it with anybody else yet have you like I was one other person okay yeah, yeah yeah so that's one thing i've not I've not really experienced yet i'd say i think everything that i've done really on with my headset has been more of a, a solo experience mm -hmm. so i think it'd be interesting to try that because i was having a conversation one of our, our clients a couple of weeks ago about, you know, what's this going to be like? And my assumption is that it will feel more immersive, but mm -hmm. I've not actually tried, like, sorry, more in this context, more immersive than being on a Teams call. Yeah. And it's not something I've tried. So I'd be really curious to, you know, try that out and, and see is that a, now a viable alternative to having an in-person brainstorm? I, I, I genuinely think, I genuinely think it will be. I think at the minute, as I say, that everybody 
if you think about even from a kit and an investment and an asset perspective for a business, you know, of our size with say 70 people, if all 70 people need to have a 300 pound headset, yeah. I have no idea what the lifespan of an Oculus headset is, but I imagine the wear and tear on them is quite considerable over time. Yeah. And I think for anybody that might be curious, the Oculus Quest 2, like you say, is 300 pounds. I think the same in, in dollars pretty much. Uh, that is the most affordable headset on the market by a long, long way from the most practical. So it's not gonna get cheaper than that. Uh, for some time, I think. Might be a, a noddy question, but are the other headsets better? Or is it just more, what's the difference? Um, I think that you can get onto like higher resolution and more powerful oh, okay. for connecting to other devices, but right. they, you know, they cost upwards of 800 yeah. pounds. In I've, seen, I've seen some costing like thousands, but I was like, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't sure what, why they were different. Cause I thought, how, how could it get better than this? But it just does, doesn't it? But, yeah, I, I, but again, I think it comes down to the application. If you're a, a big PC gamer and you want to play the, the latest games at the most power, you can still do that using the Oculus Quest, but if you want to then have the highest resolution as well, I think that's yeah. where you need the headsets. Okay. So, and what, what do you think about how far off do you think we are of this? And I, I appreciate that is how long's a piece of string at the minute because nobody really knows. I've heard some rough time frames spoken about, but I guess in terms of, I guess it depends how you you cut this because if you think about the metaverse, like the ones that currently exist as metaverses, um, from what I've seen, don't rely on the VR headset. You can access them through your laptop, and I think that's. Probably, obviously it depends where technology goes, but I think that's probably essential for adoption yep. because it means you're opening it up not only to, to people that have gone and bought a VR headset or if, if we're there, a pair of VR glasses, but just to people that you know have existing equipment. Not everybody's you know, fortunate enough to be able to go and afford some of this equipment. Mm -hmm. So that might speed up the adoption of... of um, it feels of like a stepping stone on the way towards it, doesn't it, for sure? Because I mean, I guess that's what we did with Virtual Visitor. And again, you can see that in Meta's workrooms, again, that you still have the ability to dial in, even if you haven't got a headset on, yeah. but you're on a different screen, effectively, like you would be in real life, I guess. And I think with, when you start thinking about a B2C context and the fact that there are some already in existence, mm -hmm. then you know, that might be a, a shorter time frame um, to be, become quite widely used. Yeah. I'm just going to throw out a number and say maybe that's a five years yeah. sort of thing. But I think if you're talking about more mainstream adoption um, and we're talking about, you know, glasses and we're talking about having a version that's, you know, that's potentially emerged as a winner, because I guess what we have at the minute is a lot of disparate versions. None of them uh, that are currently in existence, as far as I'm aware, are backed by any of the current tech giants. That doesn't mean they won't themselves become some of the tech giants. But if we're talking about a meta version, I'm, I'm assuming we're really talking about that being a sort of 10 year milestone to have that being yeah. widespread adopted. Well, yeah, in terms of the, the big hitters, and that's so Apple are clearly working on something at the minute, aren't they? Yeah. From, what I, from what I understand, Microsoft acquired, I'm just checking now, uh, Activision, one of, the big ga yeah. one of the big gaming organizations this week on some, some ridiculous fee. And so again, I'm sure Jim can link up an article there to that, but that was an interesting development again, because it's clearly linked to where this is going again in Microsoft's push towards embrace the, the gaming side of things and kind of the, um, I guess the metaverse again. So you're seeing people making moves towards it, but as you say, I don't think, I think even in Mark Zuckerberg's uh, keynote style thing, his presentation, he was saying three years to a, to get people on it, but by 2030, you wanted something like a billion users or something ridiculous, yeah. I think was his kind of aspirational numbers that he was talking about. And I think about. when you look at like the adoption path, I can't remember this in detail, but you know, as soon as it launches, you're gonna have some early adopters that are gonna rush to it, just as you do have with the with the current metaverse. That doesn't mean or guarantee mainstream adoption. So I guess the, the point after that is to try and make it accessible to a wider audience that aren't just mm -hmm. like the techie people that can get to grips with the tech. And I think that's probably still to some extent where uh, current VR technology is, even though it's quite established and there's a lot of really great games and multiple platforms you can play it on. I still don't think it's a thing where many people actually have one. If you actually look at like the percentage of even just percentage of gamers, let alone percentage of people. I think you're going to see that hockey sticking in, in the years to come. I think as they're pushing it more, the adverts are more, and whether it's just I'm being remarketed and retargeted to because I've recently changed it. But I, just, yeah, I don't know, I see, it seems more prevalent at the minute that it's being pushed and pushed and pushed, yeah. obviously, as, as Meta are making the huge drive towards it. And we're well, they sold out for a long time as well, mm -hmm. uh, obviously with coronavirus driving people to look for extra hobbies at home, yeah. look to experience things virtually and things like that. And I think having, you know, as soon as you try one, I think that's going to be some driver towards wanting one. And it's not mm -hmm. only about games. It's like you say, it's about social experiences in terms of other things like workplaces, if we can count that as a social experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, you know, they do concerts and all sorts of stuff within it. So I think that kind of technology is going to be the direction we go. 100%. It's just, 
I think how far does it go? I think I'm most excited, and this is why I've got like a bit of a um, passion for it at the minute, I guess, and, and really immersing myself within the space. Because you see in so many different areas of technology, marketing, um, sales come together potentially within this under this umbrella of metaverse and, and web 3.0 i guess so everything from crypto makes more sense in the virtual world for me personally at the minute nfts make a lot more sense in terms of the community aspects of it yeah. and the avatar aspects of it and the anonymity you can have behind it but also the exclusivity yeah so things like the board eight yacht clubs that you're seeing going for hundreds of thousands of pounds at the minute it's because within the metaverse it's going to be a special club yeah, that you yeah. can go to if you've got one um, and that's why I've seen celebrities snapping them up at the minute because in in what's being termed a flex culture, where in years ago you'd drive around in a Lamborghini or a Ferrari to show that you've done really well in life, in the virtual world, they don't count for much, really, do they? If, yeah. if that makes sense. The exclusivity of being in certain clubs and communities is starting to come to the forefront. Combine that with voice, combine that with sales enablement, combine that with the future of where advertising goes and amplification. It's... Yeah. It's crazy, but it's, I find it really exciting because, you know, as well as the threats and the worries around it, there's so much opportunity. Yeah. Without delving too much into NFTs as well, I think that's a really interesting point about it being more valid because I, th I suppose the current application we're seeing of NFT being quite popular is buying artwork. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy to look at that from the outside and go, you see, you've bought a picture. You bought a digital JPEG effectively. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. And, and it's really it's one of the ones where you, anybody can take a screenshot of the JPEG so anybody can have a copy of it the NFT is proving you're, you're the no, owner you of it you can't Ollie that's terrible <laughs> but when you start applying that to this uh, the idea of a metaverse it's can I have mm -hmm. my avatar wearing the latest pair of shoes and the only way you can do that is to buy an NFT and then you'll have those shoes on your avatar if that's well you buy the NFT this is where it gets it's funny then you buy tokens which is cryptos which is, which is quite common it's, it's not unusual I, mean, I don't know if you've ever done it you're not a big FIFA guy I don't think hey, but in the sense of if you've ever bought a player bought a kit upgraded a gun on Call of Duty yeah. bought a different pair well, of that, trainers that's the point I was coming on to you know. is I think, it, again, thinking about this from the outside it, uh, of looking in, it's very easy to go like, why would I waste money buying something digitally? Mm -hmm. But I think we've proven time and time again that people are willing to. And yeah, yeah I've done it to some extent as well, because it's just like, yeah, I'm playing this game for you know X hours a month, and if I spend five pounds, which isn't a big amount of money to me, I could have this character looking this way, which is, you know, I, I like the look of that, so why not? It's a small amount of money and I get to look like this. And I think, one example that's that's really interesting to me um, is, I've forgotten the name of it, but it'll come to me. Uh, oh, there's a game called Star Citizen, um, which has been in development for about 12 years at this mm -hmm. point. It's an entirely crowdfunded game, no producers, which has ha meant that basically the developer can do what they want, which has resulted in a game that's never been released because they keep scope creeping, which is a risk that yeah. everybody uh, isn't aware in terms of constantly trying to add new features to the detriment of actually delivering any product. Yeah. Uh, they've been doing that for about 12 years, continually raising more money by selling digital ships. Yeah. Sometimes for over a thousand pounds for a digital spaceship in a game that doesn't exist. And 12 years of history has shown that it's probably not going to be released anytime soon and may very well never be released. But the point of this is people are willing to part with serious amounts of money. You know, what could you do with a thousand pounds, euros, dollars, it's, whatever it might It's the be. same thing with, the, same thing with the, the Bored Ape stuff at the minute because once you get people's psychology built into the exclusivity of it, people think they're being offered something more. So they're willing to pay more for it. So in the Bored Ape Yacht Club, they offered people a poisonous banana that you could invest in that would transfer, transform your ape into a mutant ape. So this is getting a bit weird now. But in the <laughs> sense of, there's no real tangible benefit to this other than you get a second NFT, if that makes sense, which is yeah. probably worth more money in the long term and no doubt the values will go up on them. But people were clamoring for this and they were desperate to get their hands on it. And now other NFTs are doing similar kind of things to provide similar kind of utilities that go along with it. But people, people are like, you know, jumping over themselves to get their hands on these kind of things and paying, as you say, crazy sums of money for ultimately something that's relatively unproven at the minute. And the set you're seeing that as well with the kind of the land grabbing that's going on within the metaverse yeah. at the minute, which again, nobody really knows yet what that looks yeah. like. But people are paying millions of pounds for plots. And, and just to reclaim, case everybody's not uh, aware of it, when we're talking about land grabbing, we literally mean <laughs> buying plots of virtual land in one of the currently established metaverses, of which mm -hmm. there's a few out there at least where you can buy land using cryptocurrency. Yeah, so I think is it Sandbox is one of the yeah. uh, one of the main ones at the minute, which I think is Snoop Dogg's. 
uh, platform, effectively his metaverse that he's built at the minute. But yeah, there was a plot that was going next to Adidas or something, and one of the plots there was going for multi multi millions of pounds, yeah. which is effectively and then at the minute, a, few, of... a few pixels on a map yeah. in, in reality. Yeah, I think in that case, I can't remember. It's, at least some of the plots of land are being sold in platforms again that aren't even live yet. Yeah. So it's very speculative. Yeah, you know. Uh, you don't it's not like the people developing it are well again like you say well-known tech companies so when you're investing in it you don't necessarily have a guarantee that that's really going anywhere or that that's either it's a scam or that maybe just the people doing it you know do they actually have the capability to pull off what they're trying to pull off I think yeah if you get into NFTs and scams you've got a whole different podcast there but there's, <laughs> there's an awful lot that are, are on the go at the minute I guess I guess what we're saying at the minute in relation to the metaverse and Web 3.0 and cryptos and NFTs, I'm pretty sure we'll have several more podcasts to come on these because I'm conscious we've jumped around an awful lot of space there, but there's so much to go at in, in what's a relatively short episode. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the overall kind of summary would be watch, watch this space. Yeah. We're watching it intently. We're really interested in this space and we'll certainly be at the forefront of leading businesses and brands through the metaverse, Web 3.0 evolution, stroke revolution, I guess, as we get through it. Um, I guess in the meantime, what could businesses and brands be doing, do you think, to prepare themselves? Are you thinking about things like working on more immersive brand experiences, playing with virtual reality potentially if it's relevant for your products and services? Yeah, I think it's just thinking about how can you take experiences to the next step? It doesn't necessarily mean you need to run out and try and buy your own plot of land right now. Yeah. But start educating yourself, be aware of what's out there and look to... to test with your audience, I guess it's the smaller things, but do more immersive brand experiences work as a very simple example. Can you go beyond the webinar? Can you deliver something that's more engaging? Mm -hmm. That could be as simple as, could we produce an augmented reality um, kind of version of one of your products so that they can physically see it in a room? Yeah. That, that might give you an early taster of, you know, are people interested in, in you know, more, more engaging experiences than they're traditionally used to? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, great stuff. We'll leave it there for this week, guys. But thanks so much for joining us uh, to discuss all things Metaverse. Um, watch this space. We plan to launch a separate platform called B2B Meta Ready in the coming months um, to bring content like this to life for you, share articles, some blog content and some um, larger thought leadership pieces as and when we think there's some more meaningful updates for you, but more to follow on that. But in the meantime, stay well and we'll see you soon. Thanks.